Hey folks, Weingart here, and this is a lecture I gave at SMAC 2013, Sydney, Australia, best ED critical care conference ever. You've heard enough about that. And this lecture is how to avoid killing your hemodynamically unstable patient during the peri-intubation. This is part of a series of talks I give called the laryngoscope as a murder weapon. And what it's about is how to stop killing our patients in the peri-intubation. Every time you pick up a laryngoscope, you're essentially being given a license to kill. And how you go about using that license depends on how much you care about your patients. Now, it's my contention that peri-intubation deaths are preventable. That it's all well and good to blame the patient for why they coded immediately after you intubate them, but it's not the patient's fault. It's your fault because the reasons patients go down in the peri-intubations are both predictable and often preventable. And the way patients perish in the peri-intubation, the, the ways usually come in three flavors. There's the hemodynamic kills we're going to talk about today. There's the oxygenation kills, and the lecture on that topic is the one I give at all the grand round sessions uh, across the country. Or if you are out of your residency and want to hear this lecture, it's available on the MCRIT CME site. And then the patients who have low pH, the severely acidotic patients who are relying on their Kussmaul, their uh, respiratory compensation for their severe metabolic acidosis. And then you come along, you, you intubate them, their CO2 rises, and they code. And these three together I call the HOP killers, H-O-P, the HOP killers. And these are all predictable ways patients go into cardiac arrest in the peri-intubation. Today, we're going to deal with the hemodynamic kills. So let's get right to it. Let's start off with a case. It's a 43-year-old male. He's got sepsis, severe sepsis. He's got a pneumonia. It's probably MRSA. His SATs are maintaining for now. Um, but his blood pressure, when you look up at the monitor, is crappy, 62 over 40. You're intubating the patient for expected clinical course and for poor mental status. And how are you going to go about doing it safely? Well, this patient's already hypotensive. When they are already hypotensive in the peri-intubation, this is a risky situation. This is the biggest predictor of patients coding uh, during the intubation is already starting off hypotensive, already starting off needing pressors. Uh, two articles I have there. There are others, one by Mort I didn't list here, but uh, Alan Hefner in the Journal of Critical Care talked about this. Uh, really bad situation to be in, to be hypotensive before you start your intubation. So how do you go about preventing problems? Well, you plan ahead. If they're already hypotensive before you start, then it's not safe to intubate them at that point uh, unless you're absolutely forced to. If they're not hypotensive, but they have a clinical condition that predisposes them to shock or hypotension, then you should be planning ahead to do this intubation safely. And that planning ahead starts with your medication choices. Let's talk first about induction agents. Here is my priority list in order for choosing an induction agent for the intubation of a hypotensive or shocked patient. Keep them alive, no memory, no pain, no awareness. But let's put them in the order they deserve. My number one priority, the one I really care about, is preventing them from dying, keeping them alive, and everything else is a secondary consideration because you could feel really good about the fact that you gave perfect anesthesia to the patient uh, who codes and uh, no one's going to look at you like you did a good thing. Keeping them alive, priority number one. Keep that in your head. A lot of stupid stuff is done because people are really concerned about any possibility of peri-intubation awareness for that patient that then goes on to drop their blood pressure and codes. Keeping them alive is where your priority set should be. Then, once I've taken care of keeping them alive in the peri-intubation, then I'd love for them to have no memory of anything that took place. And that's my number two priority. Number three is if I could get those first two, it would be great if they had no pain or discomfort as well. And then the last one on my list, 
The absolute last one is no awareness. I'd love to have it, but if I could get the first three and sacrifice no awareness to keep the patient safe, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Because if they have no memory of it, it's not gonna cause much problem. And if there was no discomfort, then even less of an issue for me if they have some degree of an awareness. And the reason they're ordered that way is because the no awareness is the hardest one to get. And I might lose number one if I really try super hard to get number four. What you have to keep in mind is that all sedatives, all induction agents will drop the blood pressure in a patient with shock. All of them, all of them, even the ones you think are not going to drop blood pressure will drop blood pressure in a patient who's hypotensive or shocked. And the reason is that what's going through these patients' minds during a shock state is nine inch nails. They're like, my body's dying. They're pounding away with the adrenaline, with the noradrenaline. Their catecholamine tone is high. And that is part of what's going into maintaining their blood pressure. No matter which agent you give, you're gonna be taking that away and switching them over to Bob Marley. Because now all of a sudden you push your Atomidate or whatever you wanna use, and now their, their brain thinks their body's cool, even though they're, they're still hypotensive, even though they're still in peril, and now all of a sudden that, that state of nine inch nails disappears, and now they have a big doobie in their hands, and all of that sympathetic tone that they are endogenously producing goes away. So you, you have to be aware that no matter which agent you use, your potential to cause further hypotension is there. Now, you, you add to that the fact that you're taking these patients from negative pressure ventilation, which does beautiful things to augment preload, and not just normal, you know, tidal volume breathing. These guys, because of their catecholamine tone, are actually taking these great big breaths, and that's augmenting their venous return. Now, all of a sudden, you come in and intubate them, you switch them from that beautiful preload augmenting negative pressure to positive pressure, and that's going to radically change their hemodynamics. So what does all this mean? It means cardiac stable doesn't mean what you think it does. See, cardiac stable as a concept for an induction agent, often applied to agents like Atomidate, refers to that patient who's coming in for an elective valve operation, and maybe they have a uh, uh, ejection fraction of 15% and they have horrible hemodynamics. So you don't want to give them an agent for that elective anesthesia that's going to bottom their normal heart function out. But these guys aren't coming in in death's door. These guys are functional and they come in and you want to give them a cardiac stable agent for the operation, for their valve replacement or whatever cardiothoracic agent you're your uh, cardiothoracic operation you're doing. It doesn't mean that you could take a patient who's hypotensive, give them that agent, and they're going to be just fine. That's not what that term refers to. Now, I did my critical care training at the Shock Trauma Center, and the uh, director of trauma anesthesia at the time, Rick Dudden, would do every intubation with thiopental, one of the worst hemodynamic agents out there. And then when thiopental disappeared and was unavailable, he made everyone do every intubation in the center and some of the sickest trauma patients in the world with propofol, a horrible agent for hemodynamics. And the reason he did this is simply to prove a point. Now, my friend Cliff Reed talks about the propofol assassins, the people who are only used to using propofol. They come into the ICU, they intubate, and the patient dies because they gave the same induction agent uh, they're used to in the operating room. And the, the problem is not necessarily with the propofol. The problem is with the dose. And this is what I want you to take home from this section on induction agents, is the agent doesn't necessarily matter as much if you dose it properly. Now, to avoid being a propofol assassin, and the way we did it at Shock Trauma is you can use propofol for a horribly hemodynamically unstable patient if you understand one thing, and that is that the dose needs to be markedly reduced. Now, this study, um, which was a derivation of a whole bunch of animal studies and a couple human studies, um, looked at what you need uh, to get the same identical brain levels of propofol in a shock patient compared to a normal one. And what you need is a 90% reduction in dose. So if you're used to using 200, you'd reduce that to 20. If you're used to using 100, you gotta reduce that to 10. I usually give about 15 milligrams of propofol for my shock patients. And what you will have is the identical brain levels 
as if these patients were not shocked. 15 milligrams will get the same brain levels. What it won't do is have really any peripheral vasodilatory effects of any great significance. So propofol actually is reasonable. It's not a great choice. There's no reason to use an inherently vasodilating agent in these patients, but it can be used if that's what you have in your ICU. If you're in an ICU and the only agent available on the shelf is propofol, because that's what you use for your, all your intubations, you could absolutely use it in a hemodynamically unstable patient's intubation if you reduce the dose to, to somewhere around 90% of what you normally use. And the patient will get the same brain level. So they're getting the anesthesia, but they will not have that massive vasodilatory response. And they will not overdose at the brain level and kill all of their catecholamines to the extent you would if you used anywhere near a normal induction dose. So if you want to use propofol, you can. If you want to use thiopental, you can. Reduce by 90% and you'll be okay. Now let's talk about Atomini. Not even available in Australia, so I didn't dwell on it much at the SMAC conference. But Atomidate is considered by many to be the ideal agent for intubating the hemodynamically unstable patient. It's not a horrible agent. It's not my choice. And the reasons for that are a couple things. I'm not even going to wade into the... Uh, steroid suppression debate. Uh, it's still up for grabs what the final answer on that one is going to be. We know it suppresses steroid production. We know it gives some degree of uh, suppression. We don't know if that has clinically relevant consequences on patient important outcomes, so I don't know. I will tell you that each study that comes out says something different. It keeps swinging back and forth on the pendulum. So if you want to avoid the issue entirely, you could stop using Atomidate. If you want to argue the other side and say there's never been a study saying it really dramatically affects patient outcome and you want to keep using it, I'm fine with that too. Uh, allegedly gives flat hemodynamics. And that is true when you look at the intrinsic effects of the drug. There's no intrinsic effects. But again, it's going to take away the patient's endogenous sympathetic response because you're chilling them out and you're going to have all the same problems with converting from negative pressure to positive pressure. So you absolutely, absolutely could drop the blood pressure with Atomidate, but not intrinsically from the drug. Now, the thing about Atomidate that I don't like is that the dose of Atomidate to get the same brain levels in a patient uh, as whether they're shocked or unshocked, it actually is either the same or you actually need more in the shock patient, which means... Uh, I can't reduce the dose of Atominate and know the patient's going to get any decrease in their awareness or memory, which means I need to use full dose Atominate, but I don't really want to do that if I could avoid it. And now I don't really know what a half dose Atominate is going to do to a patient. And it has no uh, analgesic effect. So now if I uh, suboptimally dose and the patient is aware they're going to have pain and they may have memory. I don't like this. This doesn't do the things I want to do on my priority list. So I actually don't use Atomidate for intubating the hemodynamically unstable the patient. There's too much unknown for me. Yes, their numbers may look good, but if I dose lower, is the patient aware? Yes, they very well may be. And if they are aware, they're getting no pain control whatsoever. So you might say, well, let's use something like midazolam and fentanyl. And this is a horrible drug choice for a few reasons. First of all, there's been uh, many studies saying even what you think are low doses, two milligrams of midazolam could cause hypotension alone. Then you add in fentanyl, now you have even more of a potent hypotensive effect. And the thing about both of these agents is in a shock patient, you won't really see their effects for at least three to five minutes, meaning you are intubating with nothing except your paralytic, and then all you're gaining from this combination is maybe they'll get some post-intubation sedation and pain control. You're seeing nothing during the intubation attempt itself. This is not a great choice. The only reason this would be somewhat logical is if you were given midazolam to get the amnestic effect, but you're praying then for retrograde amnesia because this drug doesn't work soon enough to get anterograde amnesia. Not a great combination. There's really no reason to be using these. If you wanted to be smart and you thought this was a clever move, you would actually give your midazolam in a very low dose before you intubate it, a couple minutes before as you're preparing, and then at least you'd be guaranteeing some degree of anterograde amnesia and maybe the patient won't remember your uh, lack of good planning for your induction agent. So I don't recommend this. The agent I like to use is ketamine. 
Uh, now, you probably could have guessed that because uh, I just love ketamine for pretty much everything in the universe. Um, but ketamine's my choice. Let's talk about it. Ketamine, uh, if, if anything, if it's going to do something in the hemodynamics, it's going to give you a sympathetic surge. This is good. This is going to augment the patient's hemodynamics. It's going to augment the delivery of the medications and of your paralytics you're going to give later on. So I like this. Now, typically when we talk about ketamine, there's three dose ranges. There's the pain dosing, the, the sub-disassociative dosing, which is generally something like 0.1 uh, to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. Then you have the dissociative dose, one to two milligrams per kilogram, where the patient is uh, totally out of it. They're gone. They're in some like PCP-like haze. And then there's the middle ground, which during uh, procedural sedation we want to avoid because this is where the patients have nightmares. They still have some degree of perception of external stimulus, a uh, very little, but some degree. And yet they're in this weird, you know, nightmare phase where they can't perceive what's going on. And this is where you have patients, you know, yelling on the stretcher and all sorts of stuff, which you don't necessarily want during a procedural sedation. So you just keep dosing until they get disassociative. But for this situation, the hemodynamically unstable patient intubation, this middle ground is actually wonderful because they're getting a potent degree of analgesia. They're not feeling any pain at all. They're not perceiving what you're doing. They're not at all aware of what's going on during the intubation. But in their head, something's going on, and they're not going to lose that nine-inch nail song playing in their head. In fact, it might even be somewhat augmented and they might get more of a sympathetic surge. This is the ground I dose on for my shock patient intubation, is this middle ground between the pain dosing, which we're way beyond, and therefore we know the patient's getting potent analgesia, and I might not fully dissociate them. Um, middle ground dosing is what I'm using. Ketamine uh, is one of a handful of drugs in emergency medicine and critical care that pretty much within the first pass of the drug, you see the full response to that uh, administration, meaning that you will see the ketamine uh, response immediately. Propofol is like this, though it is slower than ketamine. Atomidate is like this, uh, though it's a tiny bit slower than ketamine. Ketamine is actually the fastest agent. You push it, and it will see its response. That is super important in the shock patient because uh, the dosing uh, actually gets slowed down for all of the drugs you use. It'll actually take longer to see the effects. Ketamine, uh, that slowing down will have very little effect because it's a first pass drug. One pass of that drug and you're seeing the full brain response. That's super important. That's why you can't use midazolam or fentanyl. And then as I mentioned, ketamine's an analgesic. Even if we're not fully taking away awareness, and we probably are, but even if we're not fully doing it, the patient is not feeling pain. They're not remembering exactly what happened. Now, uh, in the anesthesia world, there's, uh, especially the older school anesthesiologists, there's this perception that ketamine could cause cardiac suppression. Now, I have all the literature for this on the show notes for this podcast. Just go to mcrit.org and look for podcast 104, and you'll see all the show notes on this. A lot of this came about due to canine studies where they gave like uh, three orders of magnitude higher dosing than you'd ever see in humans and there might have been some cardiac suppression. This is not seen in normal human doses. It definitively is not seen in the uh, middle ground dosing, the reduced dosing I am talking about. These responses are all dose dependent and the doses we're giving will have no cardiac suppression possibility. So do not worry about cardiac suppression when you're using ketamine for these patients. What about using it in these patients who have potentially a TBI? You know, you get that multi-trauma patient. Can you use ketamine? You absolutely can. Uh, ketamine, when you have a patient who has that subarachnoid and their BP is, you know, 230 over 160, um, because of their Cushing's response, not a great choice because it will increase the MAP, will cause sympathetic surge, and in a non-autoregulating uh, brain can cause an increased ICP. In a patient who's normal or hypotensive, that is not an issue. You will not have any bad effects on ICP from giving ketamine. And in a hypotensive patient, if you augment their blood pressure, will actually increase cerebral perfusion and will be making the patient better. This myth was thoroughly debunked in a beautiful article in Emergency Medicine Australasia. I have that link in the show notes. So what's the take home from this induction session? You dose your induction agent based on the patient's plasma volume and clinical circumstances, which means you reduce the dose of whatever induction agent you use in a patient who is shocked. 
if you spare discomfort, if you're so worried about preventing awareness, you very well may spoil life. You very well may kill your patient in an attempt to get our fourth priority. Now, my mentor Rick Dunnan has an answer for that patient who, you know, is that one in a million who has some degree of awareness in a shock patient intubation. And it, when he said a patient would approach him and say, you know, I had, you know, I was somewhat aware when you intubated me when I came in with that massive multi trauma, Rick looks at them and says, thank God, because we thought you were dead at the time you were intubating. And uh, he says a patient never complained after he's made that statement. So we talked about induction agents. Let's talk about paralytics. What you need to understand is paralytics in a shock patient take longer to work. That the same uh, response you're expecting in a normal patient, uh, don't expect it in the hypotensive patient. It's going to take longer. So uh, you might have run into this clinical circumstance. I've run into this a few times where the nurse uh, draws up the succinylcholine. They hand you the vials. You know they drew up the right med in the right concentration, and they give it to you, and you have a beautiful functional IV, and you push the succinylcholine, and 45 seconds, and patient's still moving around. 60 seconds, patient's still moving around. 90 seconds, patient's still moving around. Now you're saying, did the IV blow? Did the medication get screwed up? You might give them another dose of sucks, and you can't figure out what's going on. Um, it's because the agent hasn't distributed. And this is a known phenomenon. This, this is one study that'll demonstrate it. And they, they used rock in this, but the response is the same in succinylcholine. And now you have a patient who uh, you give an, uh, the anesthesia dose of rock, which is dramatically too low for an emergency intubation, but uh, the point is still the same. And it takes 87 seconds to get full onset of uh, paralytics. Then you cause a, a state of poor cardiac output, and they did this in healthy patients by giving Esmolol, and you'll see that time dramatically increases, 114 seconds. Uh, when instead you augment the cardiac output, that time drops radically. The uh, onset of these paralytic agents is cardiac output dependent. And when you have a shock patient, when they have poor venous return, it's going to take a long time to see the results of your paralytic to get that response. Because paralytics don't work in the brain. It's not like ketamine first pass. Instead, they have to work on the peripheral musculature, and it takes a long time to get to all those peripheral muscles to actually cause the paralysis, the muscle relaxation. So the response you should have to understanding this is to dose higher. That's the way you fix this problem. You gotta give more med. So you dose your sedatives low, your paralytics high. So what do I use to take care of a, a patient who's already hypotensive or has the potential to be hypotensive? I actually whip out an old med. This medication, scopolamine, is a potent amnestic. And you have to use this as a pretreatment agent. So if you have a crash hypotensive patient, a patient comes in and they need to be intubated now, like literally now, then forget about the scopolamine. But if you're preparing your stuff, if you're running through the MCRIN intubation checklist and you have two or three minutes, I pretreat with scopolamine because this, like just like the midazolam, takes a while to work. So you know, at the point where I'm like, oh God, this guy needs to be intubated, but I have a couple minutes, I'll give the scopolamine. I'll give a dose of 0.4 milligrams of scopolamine. And now beautiful things happen. First of all, most potent amnestic agent. So no matter what else takes place, even if I forgot about my inductive agent, uh, they're not going to remember the intubation. And the only side effect of this med, aside from a dry mouth, which is beautiful for me, uh, is some degree of tachycardia, which I want. I actually want them to get tachycardic because I want to increase their cardiac output in the peri-intubation. Then I will give ketamine, but I'll give a quarter to a half dose. Usually I just stick with a half dose, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. I avoid all the dose-dependent side effects of ketamine. I'm putting them in that middle ground. They're getting potent analgesia. They're not going to be aware, but they're going to get a sympathetic surge as opposed to me taking away the sympathetics like I would with the atomidate dosing. And the other beauty is if you combine scopolamine and ketamine, very potent antidepressants. So when you take that drug user who got shot and now you get them through their entire hospital course and you're sending them to jail, they don't have to be as upset about it. Then for my paralytic, I will either give a very high dose of sucks, two milligrams per kilogram, or a very high dose of rock, even higher than I normally use in the regular patient intubation, which is 1.2 milligrams. I'm actually going to give 1.6 milligrams per kilogram of rock uranium. And if you want to see the reasons for that, the uh, reference is right here and it's in the show notes. 
Now, we talked about medication choices. Let's talk about what else you should be doing in the peri-intubation. Obviously, you should be giving fluids, and that fluid may be crystalloid in your septic patient, and in a trauma patient, it's going to be blood and FFP. But you're loading that in the pre-intubation and during the intubation itself because you know the patient's going to drop. You want to shoot for a higher than normal BP before you intubate if you have the time, which means in a septic patient, you know, you get your pressure drip on before you intubate, not afterwards, before you intubate. And oftentimes, if I have a, a septic shock patient, I'll put them on a norepi dose as I'm loading the fluid and shoot for something like a systolic of 140, a MAP of 80, to actually get them higher than normal so that as soon as I intubate and they drop, they drop to exactly where I want them to be, which is a MAP of 65. If I have a trauma patient, uh, I love uh, to do hypotensive resuscitation, as I've talked about in prior podcasts, but I'll let them drift a little bit higher with my blood and FFP right before I intubate, knowing they're going to drop. Like I'm saying, put them on an inopressor drip before you start the intubation if that's their problem is vasodilation. So if I have my septic patient, I already have that norepi drip on before I intubate. Even if I have to put it on at zero micrograms, just sitting there on the pump so that if they are normotensive before I start, but they have the potential to become hypotensive, all I have to do now is press start on the pump and boom, they now have their norepi drip. I don't have to wait 10 minutes for that drip to be mixed up. But what I always have in hand for every, every hypotensive intubation or potentially hypotensive intubation is I have my push dose pressors in hand at the bedside, mixed up, ready to go. And that push dose presser for the hypotensive intubation is always epinephrine, always epinephrine, not phenylephrine. Because if I have to give something during the intubation attempt itself, I want something that's gonna augment my drug delivery, that's gonna augment the time of onset of my paralytic and not take it away. Phenylephrine will actually make the blood pressure go up but actually take longer for my sucks or rock to work. Epi will make that situation better. And that study was seen just a few slides ago. So between phenyl and epi, it's no, no doubt epi is the one you want for the peri-intubation shock. All right, I have the mixing instructions on the podcast. There's a whole podcast about this. You could check it out. All right, your vent settings. When you put them on the vent right after you intubate them, they were hypotensive or they have the potential to become hypotensive. Start low on your pressures. Start low on your PEEP because this is a way to make it even worse that you're putting them on positive pressure. If you put them on positive pressure and 20 of PEEP, they're probably going to plummet on their blood pressure. So as you're resuscitating, then you can work up on the higher vent pressures and the, um, the PEEP. So I will start these guys six cc's per kg. I don't mind if their CO2 goes up a bit if I'm not worried about TBI or uh, intracranial pressure. If, if I am, then obviously I have to balance those two between them plummeting their blood pressure, which is horrible for their brain injury, versus their CO2 drifting up, which is also not so great. This is where being an excellent clinician comes in. So low and slow is the way you go. The last concept I'll talk about, and this is something I've been playing with for a couple years now, it's probably not ready for prime time, but I use it and you can consider using it, is the concept of applying delayed sequence intubation to the hemodynamically unstable patient. And I call this hemodynamically, uh, hemodynamic DSI, and there's other stuff in the literature about this as well uh, with a similar idea. But the hemodynamic DSI is, I will actually push small aliquots of ketamine uh, before I intubate to see what it's going to do to their blood pressure and hemodynamics, knowing that these small little aliquots of ketamine, this uh, 20 milligrams at a time, uh, won't stop them breathing in that peri-intubation, will actually uh, augment my drug delivery and let me see exactly to the point where they're disassociated. Because some of these patients, the hypotensive ones, only need 20 or 40 milligrams and they're fully dissociated and yet their hemodynamics are good. Now I know after that happens that I could push my paralytic safely. And if I gave 20 of ketamine and you know their blood pressure drops a little before I convert them to positive pressure, I will continue resuscitating them and actually get that fixed before I now push my paralytic intubate and put them on positive pressure. So it's out there. Uh, I'd like to see you know, a bunch more patients before I say, you know, do this willy-nilly, but I just want to talk about it as a concept. All right, so let's bring it all home. You got to plan ahead. If they start off hypotensive, it's just going to get worse when you intubate. If they have the potential for hypotension, consider 
what's going to happen after you intubate them. Dose smart. That means for your induction agents, low. I use ketamine. If I have time, I'll add in scopolamine. If you're going to use something like propofol, 10%, 15% of the dose you normally use. If you're going to use Atomidate, I don't know what to tell you with dosing. I'd like to reduce the dose, but I don't know what that's going to do to the patient's awareness. If you're paralytics, it's easy. Dose high. Dose higher than you're used to. And then if they do drop their BP, you got to respond aggressively. These patients have a huge potential to go into cardiac arrest. You don't want that. So respond aggressively. You should have planned for it beforehand. You should add your pressure drip sting there. You always should have push dose pressures at the bedside. Every time you pick up a laryngoscope, you are being given a license to kill. How you go about using it depends on how much you care about your patients. This is the most vulnerable time during their hospital course. Their lives are in your hands. Please, please do not let the laryngoscope be a murder weapon. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention.